I'm going to talk about uh, the same problem and the generalized Timbal method today. Um, I'm not going to be able to talk about all the systems we studied, um, and I'm not going to actually uh, <coughs> indicate which papers include the material. Uh, the material is included in some of these papers we uh, collected here. The plan for today is uh, to first define what the sign problem is in the context of important sampling, and uh, then uh, uh, talk about how to use complexifications and contour deformation to uh, alleviate or solve this problem. And I'm going to first uh, um, discuss uh, this solution in the context of a single thimble approach, which I'll define soon, and then uh, show its shortcomings and uh, I'll go on to uh, talk about the generalized thimble method and uh, show how this works in one particular case, the massing theory model in one plus one dimension. And I'll draw some conclusions at the end. So um, why are we interested in systems with the same problem? Many physical interest, interesting systems have a sign problem, like QCD at finite variant density, and uh, this is connected with a lot of uh, phenomenology that's uh, interesting, uh, experiments at RIC, you know, neutral star structure and so on. Um, Real-time dynamics for strongly coupled QFT is also something that uh, has a very strong sign problem, and it will be very wonderful if we can figure out a way to solve it. And obviously, there's uh, uh, problems in condensed matter physics. And uh, in this workshop and the school before it, we heard about a, a number of other systems that are uh, very much interested to the physics community that have assigned problems. So uh, that's uh, the impetus behind this uh, uh, research. Now, it is well known now that there's not going to be any kind of universal solution to the same problem, but that doesn't mean that individual systems will not have their own solutions. And uh, what I'm arguing today is that Timble method is likely to be one such tool to attack um, systems that have sign problem. I'm going to uh, discuss this in the context of uh, quantum field theories, uh, which are uh, the way I'm going to define them is using the lattice regulator. Uh, we're going to use the Feynman path integral approach, and uh, we usually work in Euclidean dynamics. The fields are sampled on a grid. Differential operators are replaced by finite differences. And, you know, here is, I'm giving a sketch of a derivation for how you get a, a lattice action that corresponds to a quantum field theory um, uh, for a, a scalar field. The important thing is that you end up with an action that is basically a polynomial in the field sampled on this lattice point. And uh, the integral that you have to do, the path integral, it's a large dimensional integral, but it's basically over real variable. Even if the fields were complex, you can always arrange it, you know, that it's just a large integral over many real degrees of freedom. And what's important for the discussion uh, that follows is that the integrand has no singularities for both bosonic and fermionic theories. So, um, how do we usually attack this in Laris? Um, the observables of interest are, um, can be written in the path integral approach. Uh, this way, if uh, we work in uh, Euclidean time dynamics, usually the uh, action is real that appears here. So this actually looks really like a statistical mechanics problem. And the way we do it, we use important sampling. We generate a bunch of configurations using the Boltzmann factor controlled by the action. And then the observables are basically estimated as averages over the sample fields. Now, um, this is a stochastic method and each of these estimators will have errors. And uh, the errors will basically decrease with the square root of size of the sampled space. When the partition function is not real, so where the action is not real, uh, we cannot do direct Monte Carlo sampling. However, that's not always a problem. There is a workaround, which uh, it's sort of classic in lattice techniques. It's called reweighting. We sample the fields based on the 
real value of the integrand, the absolute value of the integrand. This basically tells you that you just sample the fields according to the real part of the action. And then the imaginary part of the action is introduced uh, at, uh, you know, together with the observable. So this is an exact mathematical relation. And uh, in practice, what you do, you generate a bunch of configuration based on the Boltzmann factor that is controlled by the real part of the action. And then what you do, you do an estimator that it's based on this combination here. It's a, basically a rewrite in the estimator sense of this relation. Now, you do have a sign problem when the factor that appears here in the denominator, which is some average phase, is much, much smaller than n, the number of sample points. Okay, uh, and you know sometimes it's nearly zero or exactly zero, and uh, then you run into a sign problem. And the idea is that <clears throat> in order to actually sample this estimator with uh, enough precision, you need a number of sample that basically is inversely proportional with the value of this average phase. Okay. So, for example, in QCD, this average phase you can show that it's just a ratio of two partition functions. And uh, that ratio can be expressed, you know, it's an exponential into a difference in the free energy density. And as the volume goes to infinity, you can show that this goes exponentially fast to zero in the volume. So the number of sample points that you need to actually get reweighting to work grows exponentially fast with the volume of the lattice. So that's the sign problem. And that's what we're trying to solve. So how are we going to solve it? We're going to use contour deformation. So imagine, you know, I'm uh, using here, as I said, the partition function is going to be an integral over a very large number of degrees of uh, degrees of freedom. Uh, here I'm taking a sort of a simple sketch, you know, an integral over a single degree of freedom where the action is some complex action that it's quartic and so on. And uh, so uh, if I am to evaluate this on the real axis, this will lead to an oscillatory integrand. Uh, one way to deal with it is to deform the contour. So you promote the integrand, the, sorry, the variable that you integrate over to a complex variable. And then you, instead of integrating over the real axis, you could in principle integrate over any other contour that satisfies a couple of conditions. So first of all, you have to make sure that this deformation of the contour doesn't cross a singularity. And that's not a problem with this type of actions because they don't have any kind of singularity so that you can, in principle, deform at will. The other uh, condition that you have to make sure that you fulfill when you deform the contour is that you don't go into an uh, area where the integration becomes ill-defined. You know, So, uh, we, for example, here the action is controlled by this quartic term at large uh, axis. And uh, if you go in the complex plane, the integral is only well defined as long as the contour is uh, stays in this uh, gray, uh, gray area. Okay, so this is a, a thing that you have to worry about when the integrant is non-compact. You know, but if you have compact variables, that's not something that you have to worry about. You know, if you have periodic uh, periodicity, then periodicity, as long as you preserve it, everything is fine. So you can really, pretty much deform the contour at will. Okay. Now, you deform the contour with the hope that, you know, some contours are actually better, you know, the integral is the same, but hopefully the numerical properties of the sam uh, sampling this new contour are better. And one particular proposal by uh, Cristoforetti, Di Renzo, and Scorzato was to actually use the deformation of the contour that uses thimbles, okay? Now, um, we heard a lot in the school about thimbles, they are intimately connected to, um, first of all, the saddle points, which we call critical points for the action that uh, I uh, derived on, or I showed on the previous slide. Um, the action was quartic, so this equation for the critical points has three values, you know, so there are three saddle points or critical points. They are not real, they are in the complex plane. And what I'm showing here are the three critical points. Associated with each of the critical points, there are uh, a thimble and an unstable thimble. The thimbles are indicated by these black lines that you have here. And there's another one that goes like this. And the unstable thimbles are the blue lines that are indicated here. 
Now, how do we define the symbols? We define the symbols with regard to this flow. Okay, this flow here, this is the tau, which is induced by the complexified gradient of the action, has the following properties. If you actually decompose the variable into the real and imaginary part, you see that the evolution under the flow of the real variable, it's controlled by the gradient of the real action. So it's like a gradient flow as far as the real part of the action is concerned. You know, look, both dx, dy are controlled by the gradient of the real part. If you look at the imaginary part of the action, you see that the flow is actually Hamiltonian with respect to the imaginary part of the action. So the flow uh, actually preserves the imaginary part of the action, and because it's a gradient flow for the real part of the action, it increases the, um, the real part of the action. So that's the arrows here and the, the flow lines indicate integrals of this flow, you know, in this uh, figure. What you notice is, <clears throat> now the, the, the blue curves, which are the unstable timbles, are actually the collection of points that under the flow, flow into the critical point, okay? The timbles, or the stable timbles, are the collection of points that under the opposite of the flow, the downward flow flow into the critical point. So that's the definition of that. It's a bit uh, implicit, you know, but uh, that's the definition. The important thing is, if you look at the flow lines, you find that the flow around this uh, uh, timbles are nearly parallel with it. The orthogonal component of the flow around the timbre vanishes, and uh, that will be important later on. So, if I follow the uh, advice of uh, Scorzato and company, I will decompose this integral into an integral over these two timbres, this timbre plus this other timbre. What's interesting about the value of the, uh, you know, why do you want to deform over the timbres is the fact that <clears throat> because the timbres actually constitute uh, points that flow into each other under the flow, that means that the imaginary part of the action stays fixed. So on these timbles, the imaginary part of the action doesn't fluctuate at all. It's only the real part of the action that changes. And the real part of the action is actually minimal at the critical point and increases away from the critical point and increases in the steepest way. That's why this, these are basically generalization of the steepest descent paths. So uh, numerically, these uh, things lead to integrals that are very easy to sample and uh, they have no fluctuations, no uh, imagined part fluctuations, and they also are very well concentrated around the critical points, the sample points of the... Okay, dokie. It turns out that uh, this is not just true for this integral. Basically, any convergent integral that goes from minus infinity to plus infinity in the plane can be decomposed into this uh, timbre structure, and the way uh, these decompositions go, they involve some uh, integral factors, and the integral factors are actually connected to the intersection between the unstable timbre for every critical point with the original integration domain. So, for example, this point, the unstable timbre goes like this, so it intersects the original domain. This point, the unstable timbre goes like this, it intersects the original domain, so these two things contribute. Whereas this point, the unstable timbre goes like this, it does not interact the original domain, so it doesn't contribute, you know? So these numbers count basically how many times the unstable timbre associated with the critical point intersect the original uh, integration domain. So how do we make money out of this? You know, imagine that you try to integrate an action that looks like this, it's a bit contrived, it's an oscillatory integral, but it's Gaussian. If I were to try to actually sample it on the real plane, where x1 and x2 are real, um, I would get, a, you know, I'm plotting here just the real part of the action. Um, and so I get things that go up and down all the time. I, they have magnitude roughly one, so it's plus one and minus one. If I were to just sample on the real part of the action, I'll get a bunch of points here, and I have to add them up and they have to add up to the full integral. But because it's quadratic, I actually know the value of this integral. It's about 10 to the minus 53 or something. So I would need basically of the order of 10 to 100 points to add up to get any kind of uh, 
good stochastic error you know, for this uh, result to get even the magnitude of the final result. 10 to 100 points, even on a fastest computer, takes longer than the lifetime of the universe. Okay? So that's uh, impractical. However, because this is a quadratic function, we can actually figure out what the critical points are. There is only one critical point, and the timbal associated with it is basically a flat hypersurface. Okay? And if I am to move on that hypersurface and sample this integral, on this hypersurface, the integral looks very fine, it's Gaussian. And even if I take one sample point, let's say the point at the critical point, I get a value of 10 to the minus 53. So one sample already gives me the right magnitude of the answer. You know, you get 10 samples, you know, you already have a good precision of what the final answer is going to be. So that's how it, you hope to make money out of it. So um, the whole approach suggested by uh, Cristoforetti, Scorzato, and Renzo um, is a bit complicated to apply in the multi timbal case. So uh, they suggested that maybe one single timbal dominates this decomposition, this timbal decomposition. And if we figure out methods to actually sample a single timbal, we might actually be able to get um, physical results out of it. Now, when you sample one single timbal, what's nice about it is that the imaginary part of the action on the one single timbal in the ratios completely drops out. And what you're left with is this simple integral. So basically, you have to sample now an integrand that is obviously positive. Uh, if you want to do to, uh, to a Monte Carlo. Um, so in principle, the problem, the sign problem seems completely solved. There is no imaginary piece in the action. However, um, if you actually think about this timbal, so for example, let's say that I'm, uh, I have this Rn, and I have only one timbal contribute, so I'm schematically indicating the timbal here, so I want to replace this integral over Rn with this integral over a timbal, which is fine and nice defined. The sample points on the timbal have real action, but the measure dz actually has a phase that is associated basically with the orientation of the element with respect to the real plane. Okay? So there is a, another phase, complex phase, that's buried in there. So in order to actually do sampling, you have to do sampling based on the absolute value of the measure times the integrand, which is real and positive definite. And so in principle, it's, we use the same technique, the reweighting, where this phase is actually dialed in at the measurement stage. This could introduce a sign problem, but it doesn't. I'll show you. So that's not really an issue. But it's something to keep in mind. Now, the big problem in terms of actually formulating an, a numerical method to work with this is trying to actually figure out a way to sample things on the timbal. As I said, the timbal is described in an implicit way. All the points that flow downwards into the critical point. So it's not trivial to actually stay on the timbal. One possibility that we proposed is to you know, look at the probability distribution on the timbal and imagine that you take every point and you flow it back with the downward flow. So you just invert a map, you know, invent a map that takes every point and flows downwardly towards the critical point by some fixed time. Okay? This map has the property that basically it contracts the distribution towards the critical point. And what's nice that if you do contract it towards the critical point, we actually have a very good technique to figure out how to stay uh, on the timbal close to the critical point, because we have a good uh, analytical way to describe the tangent plane to the critical point. Okay? So the idea would be then, if I want to do an integral over a timbal, I do a change of variables where uh, the Zn are basically the images through this map, to this contraction map of uh, the integral. So I replace this integral with another integral, but now the near points will all be concentrated around the critical point, and there I can actually approximate their position. Okay? So the logic is the following. At least to sample a single timbal, I'm going to use a map for a given flow time. I'm going to re-express this integral. This is an exact relation, but if the flow time is large enough, I can actually replace this z near points instead of being on the timbal, I can make them be on the tangent part of the timbal, which I know how to parameterize quite well. And uh, so 
what I'm going to do, I'm going to try to sample this integral here. The z are actually now on the tangent manifold, and uh, I'm going to flow this z far away to find its pre-image, and I'm going to have to actually sample with the real part of this effective action. Let me try to explain what the approximation is a little bit. So if I only flow a very little time, I take basically the timble and flow it through this map, I'm going to generate these other surfaces which is not quite the timble that I want. But as I increase the flow time, this will start hugging more and more the timble. As the flow goes to infinity, you're not going, going to be basically get the integral that you want. The way this is done, the sampling is always done on this parameterization space, on the timble, you know, the near points. But uh, as you increase the flow time, you always stay on this timble, but the uh, sampling points are just concentrated more and more around the critical uh, point. So that's the logic of it. So let's see how this works. I'm going to use a very simple tiering model. So it has a staggered light discretization of the uh, fermionic part of the action, and I have some uh, uh, auxiliary variables if you want, you know, some bosonic fields. Um, you can integrate out the fermionic degrees of freedom, and the partition function then becomes simply a function of this bosonic action and the determinant of the fermionic. Uh, What's nice about this thing is that it was solved analytically, so we know the analytical results, so we can compare it. So um, this model has a sign problem, so if you were to do it the reweighting way, the way we described it earlier on, the sign actually drops around uh, mu equal one, drops down quite uh, severely, so it has uh, something that looks like a sign problem. And uh, let me try to present some numerical results. The first check that we did was, let's see, how this observable actually converges as you increase the flow time, you know, because as you increase the flow time, the manifold that you're doing, it gets closer and closer to the uh, timbre, and you see that as you increase the flow time, an observable, you know, basically flattens out after a while. This is the exact value. You see that this flattens out, but at a value that is slightly different than the exact value that will play a role later on. So, um, as I mentioned, this uh, has a sign problem, but if you actually look at the residual phase, the residual phase is completely flat. You know, it's equal with one. So this residual phase has no sign problem. You know, so. And um, now I'm going to actually look at the condensated function of the chemical potential. These are the exact results plotted here, and the dotted, the, the, the points, the curve is the exact result, and the points are actually the results of the numerical simulations. Now. The agreement is very good, and the errors are very small, so what I'm going to plot here is actually the difference between the, the uh, Monte Carlo results and the exact results, and you see that they're all comparable with zero. <coughs> <coughs> However, if you go to low temperature, again, this is very nice. It looks like it sort of follows it, but if I look at the difference, I see that up to a point, you know, the, the agreement is perfect, but in some region of mu, space, the agreement is actually very poor. You know, it's many, many sigmas different. And the reason for it is because, actually, more than one symbol contributes to the exact result, okay? And what we sample is basically just one symbol, the, what we thought to be the dominant symbol. And uh, the hope was that maybe, at least in the continuum limit, you have actually a single symbol dominate. And we've studied that. This is a number of points as we go towards the continuum limit. And what we find is that we converge to a continuum limit that looks something like this, but it's different than the exact result. So even in the continuum limit, one single timbre does not dominate. So now, <clears throat> uh, let me go and introduce the generalized timbre method. Um, most systems require multiple timbre, and uh, uh, to even figure out analytically the timbre decomposition, it's a very difficult problem, and to sample it is also very difficult, but it turns out that the method that we actually invented to do a single timbre can be actually viewed differently, and uh, you can actually set it up as a method to sample multiple timbres at once, and even do the timbre decomposition automatically. So to explain how this goes, imagine that I take actually the Original integration domain, R over N, Rn, and I flow it for a fixed time. That will generate some manifold M. Now, 
by the properties of the, manif the, of the flow, the manifold actually, the integral over the manifold. I'm already done. Uh, I still have five minutes, yes, okay. So uh, um, the integral over the manifold is exactly equal with the integral over the over original uh, thing. So I could integrate over this manifold. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to integrate over this manifold because it has better numerical properties, okay? So to understand why it has better numerical properties, imagine that you flow this an a very large time. What's going to happen with generic points, they will just flow to infinities. But as this manifold moves towards infinities, there are obstacles in this way. And the obstacles are actually exactly the timbers. Because as you remember, maybe, the flow at the surface of the timble is parallel with the timbers. So you cannot cross the timbles with the flow. And that's how this whole decomposition happened, the timble decomposition happened. The whole, uh, um, this manifold basically starts hanging the timbles. So what we're going to do is going to do something like this. We're going to flow this and integrate over a manifold at a given flow time. Now, as you increase the flow time, what you'll see is that the, on the parameterization manifold, you'll have samples that you know, uh, basically concentrate around these intersection points between the unstable manifold and the original integration manifold. And as you flow more, the concentration will be larger and larger. So the distribution becomes multimodal. Okay, that's something to keep in mind. Okay, so to see how this works, we apply to the one plus one massive Turing model. Again, similar things happen. We have here uh, uh, introduce a discretization. The discretization uses compact variables and uh, then the uh, discretization of the fermion determinant can be integrated out and you know, you're left with this action. So uh, the action only depends on this uh, field uh, variables, A nu. And um, I'm actually trying to now give you an indication of how the timbal structure is in this large dimensional space in new. It's many, many dimensional, so I'm going to focus only on one section. So I'm going to look at A0, the mean value of A0. And uh, in here, uh, I'm complexifying this value, so I have the real and imaginary part. This dot line, these dots are actually corresponding to the critical points, so each of them will have a timbal. These are the timbles, and you note that the timbles actually stop at the zeros of the determinant. Now, I can, since this is a complex thing, I can shift this at will. So one uh, idea is to shift the integration domain to go through one of the critical points. And then I can start actually doing a flow instead of from the real space, from the, this uh, shifted contour. It's more advantageous numerically. If I do a little bit of flow, that's the manifold that I get. And you see in the sampling space, the distribution will concentrate around the minima of this uh, uh, potential. As I increase the flow time, this is the manifold that I described. The uh, values sampled in the point will concentrate even more. And as I increase the flow time even more, I get to hug basically the timbles, and I have very narrow distribution in the imaginary space. So first, the sign problem for this uh, model, you know, the um, if I actually were to look at the sign problem of the original integration around mu equal 1, I have a very severe sign problem, I cannot sample it. If I just shift the integration domain, the sign problem is ameliorated, you still have a sign problem for larger mu equal 3. But if you start flowing, then very quickly, for a small flow time, the sign problem basically disappears. And you can do calculations, and here is maybe one of the important results I'm plotting here the density as a function of the chemical potential. On finite volumes at zero temperature, you would expect this to have steps. You know, um, this is the famous silver blaze. And that's exactly as we see. As we lower the temperature, we start reproducing the state structure. Why this is important is because this system has been analyzed by uh, the collaboration here. And they found that if I actually do a calculation that involves a single timbal, analytically for this uh, system, they get a curve, no matter what temperature, how low the temperature is, that just goes basically like this. It misses the steps completely. So the multi-timbles are absolutely required in order to get the silver blaze phenomenon for this uh, type of system. And with our method, we get it, you know, so it's no problem. We computed other things like the continuum limit for these results and uh, the thermodynamic limit. And in both cases, we get very sensible result consistent with expectations. So let me draw some conclusions. I want to say that complex manifold integration is feasible. 
and it works for both bosonic and fermionic systems, and that's important. And the residual phase fluctuation is mild, you know, so for most systems you, you, you don't have any problem. Actually, we've never seen a system where you have a problem because of that. Uh, Fields complexification serves as an op to control the same problem. I described basically a particular type of deformation here, but there is an enormous class of deformation you can invent and see, you know, if you can design one that actually has uh, uh, beneficial properties from a numerical point of view. The decomposition, uh, Lifshitz decomposition timbre, is a limiting case for a holomorphic flow, and it has some problems. It's difficult to sample to set up numerical methods to actually, when multiple timbre contributes. If a single timbre contributes, then you're fine, but when you have multiple timbre, it's a problem. And one uh, solution is to use this holomorphic gradient flow and generate these manifolds that interpolate basically between the original integration manifold where you have a severe sign problem and the T infinite, they go basically into the timbal decomposition where the sign problem presumably gets milder or disappears. Uh, but there the, you, you have a little bit of problems to sample multimodal distributions. So it's beneficial to actually keep the T flow somewhere in between where you get the benefit of the uh, uh, small sign problem, you know, and the, the, the but no, no multimodal distributions. And this method can be used to attack a, a lot of problems with fermions, quantum field theories. I didn't talk about real-time dynamics and uh, other things. Hopefully some of you will use it to attack some of the problems described in this workshop. Thank you for your attention. One or two questions? Hi. I wanted to ask uh, concerning the multimodal distribution that you mentioned. Um, so if you increase the lattice size, how, how much the severity of the problem actually increases? I mean, are the barriers between the minima increasing with the lattice size and how? So. Um... That's a very good question. We haven't studied it in the detail. So what we find is that the severity of the same problem, we know it increases with the volume. Uh, when we say lattice size, you mean towards thermodynamic limit, yes? Yeah. So it increases with uh, the volume. So what we had to do in order to uh, you know, make the same problem smaller, we have to increase the flow time. But then in order to actually figure out you know, the right thing, you, know, you have to do quantitative studies of this, and we haven't yet done that. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, does this work? Uh, so, I don't know how good of a question this is in general, but um, so when you use this holomorphic gradient flow method and you integrate over uh, some manifold that you get uh, and then you phase quench, you have some residual systematic error coming from the phase quenching. It's not a systematic error, it's just something that you have to include in the observable and you can gauge whether that introduces a problem or not based on how uh, the, the fluctuations, how, whether the, fluct the average value of the phase gets close to zero. You basically get a mean value and a stochastic error. And if the stochastic error gets closer to zero, then basically you have a problem, you know. Okay. And uh, for us, you know, the, this uh, mean value stays close to one, way away from zero. So that's not, not a problem. But you could quantify the, uh, I'll call it the systematic error due to the phase, but you can quantify this error uh, for, for a problem where you don't know the exact answer? Um, no, I, I, I think it, it's not a systematic error. Let me make it clear. You know, so if you can actually do reweighting, that doesn't introduce any kind of systematic error. Reweighting, you know, the, at least the phase sign reweighting would only create problems when the average phase is close to zero. Okay? Thank you. Reweighting is not quenching. That's the point. It's just shuffling of terms around. Any other question?